Um, finally, uh, uh, I am quite honored to have my parents here with us tonight. So, <laughs> It, um, as our Lord said um, in the Gospel of John, it is one thing to be born of the flesh, it is another thing to be born of the Spirit. And so I'm very thankful to uh, my parents for bringing me into this world. I'm much more thankful for the faith they gave me. Um, as you can probably tell, my mother is Filipino, and I'm not. <laughs> But uh, my mother died when I was nine years old, and she came into our lives, and um, I'm so thankful for that because um, through all the difficulties that happen in, in life like that, where you get a new person in the house and all of that, she never stopped praying for us and never stopped being an image of Jesus Christ in my life. Okay, and it's the same with my dad. Every time I, I stumbled in life, which I definitely stumbled, um, he never stopped telling me the truth. Never stopped telling me the truth. Every single time I saw him. And so, um, through that guidance, when things got difficult, I looked back upon my foundation, and I found a foundation in the faith. And so, I came back to the faith, and I came back to church. And that's the reason I'm here today. So, mostly I'm thankful to them for that. Okay, you have your uh, handout. Did I have it back? Who didn't get a handout? Grab one, you'll want it. Who didn't bring their Bible with them tonight? Mon, there's one Bible back there. Can you give it to my parents? My dad is guilty of not bringing his Bible with him. Don't make copies. We're out. Okay, don't make copies. It's okay. It's okay. Come on. Sit down. Sit down next to somebody that has one you can share. We'll have more love that way. You better get started. St. Mary Magdalene. All right, here we go. It's like a rock concert here sometimes. St. Mary Magdalene. What do we know about St. Mary Magdalene? Who was she? What was her identity? What's that? She was from Magdalene. Oh, that's true. <laughs> All right, she was the first witness to the resurrection. But who was she? What was her identity? She was a teenager. What was the back her background? Seven demons came out of her. All right, all right. She was a sinner. Seven demons came out of her. What else? What kind of sinner was she by tradition? Prostitute. Yeah, a harlot. Do you know that there's nowhere in the sacred scriptures? People with me? There is nowhere in the sacred scriptures that says she was a harlot. Did you know that? Yes. Okay. That she was a harlot. A harlot. That her life of sin had something to do with improper relationships with men. Okay? But that is the tradition that is held. So what do we know about her? First of all, she was at the crucifixion. Adoring our Lord at the side of our Blessed Mother and at the side of John the Beloved. St. John the Beloved. Okay, in a sense, she had a similar vision as they did. She was at the burial with Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. She was at the resurrection. She ran to the tomb with Peter and John. Okay. And she was a woman from which seven demons were cast. Seven demons. Luke chapter 8. If you have your Bibles on, you turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke 
Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. <laughs> Verse 1. Soon afterward, he went on, he is Jesus there. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, preaching and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalena, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa. Herod Stewart, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. So Mary Magdalene had had a past of some sort of demonic oppression. Okay. She had come to our Lord and been healed. And she lived her life walking with the apostles, with our Lord, on a daily basis. And in some sense, living with them. Okay. Um, think about the book, the uh, movie, Da Vinci Code. Yeah. You know, sometimes the devil, and I say sometimes, all the time, all the time, the devil takes a truth and he twists it ever so slightly. He'll never just absolutely turn it on its head because he would know he would be exposed. He's not that stupid. He twists it just a little bit. Okay. We're going to be talking about Mary Magdalene in the garden of the Lord, Mary Magdalene, part of the mystical marriage with Christ. In some sense, a type of the bride of Christ, a type of the church, okay? one who was spiritually wedded to our Lord. The Da Vinci Code takes that truth and twists it, twists it just ever so slightly until it becomes one of the greatest offenses modern attacks upon our Lord today. Okay. So as we go through this, notice the language we're using. Notice how the church fathers, the direction the church fathers push us. And it runs in some sense side by side with that modern notion. And yet the conclusion is so far different. It's another world. Okay. So here she is walking with our Lord. In the chapter before, in chapter 7... It, throughout the scriptures, there's a num there are a number of Marys and a number of women who remain nameless in the scriptures. And it is part of the traditional interpretation of Mary Magdalene's identity to see some in, in her something of each one of these women. Some have said that she is the Samaritan woman at the well. Why? Why? The Samaritan woman had five husbands. Okay. Some say she was the woman who was caught in adultery in the Gospel of John. Chapter 8 of the Gospel of John. You remember our Lord goes to the temple and they drag her in front of him. So what are we to do with her? Trying to test our Lord. And he, he identifies himself as the Feast of Tabernacles as the light of the world. He forgives her sins. He says, whoever is sinless, throw the first stone. And they walk away. Okay, or no, I, I'm sorry, he writes, in the, he writes in the sand. Okay, And they walk away. One by one. And he forgives her sins. Okay? But chapter 7, also, a woman is comes forward. Okay? When our Lord goes to the house of the Pharisee. And it has been a traditional interpretation to see in this woman, Mary Magdalene. Okay? So let's look at chapter 7, verse 36, Melanie. Until when? 36 uh, to the end of the chapter. Okay. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was sitting at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, What is it, teacher? 
A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he forgave them both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, to whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I gave it, I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he, he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay. Another image of Mary Magdalene that we see in the scriptures that tradition has pointed out to us is Mary, the sister of Lazarus, the sister of Martha. Okay of which we don't know a whole lot about, except that she did what? She sat at his feet. She was there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And shortly after that incident, in the Gospel of John, in the next chapter, our Lord returns to the house of Lazarus to eat supper with him and his sisters. And Mary brings in a jar of ointment. And she kneels down at his feet, and anoints his feet and wipes them with her hair. Okay, Very similar text to what we just read in Luke chapter 7. Okay, So we can see in these different images reasons for the kind of bringing together of these different, different women to say it's possible that they were the same woman. It is possible. Okay, And they tell us something about Mary Magdalene's life. One other point about her that it may be helpful in understanding why tradition has seen her as a harlot is the city she comes from, okay, which is, Bill? Magdalene. Yeah, a city on, I believe, the north, the western side of the Sea of Galilee, okay? Do you know anything else about that city? Yeah, it was known for uh, rather loose living. Yeah, licentious behavior. And what happened to the city? It was destroyed by the Romans. It may be rebuilt now. Is it rebuilt? I don't know. Yes. It was. It is. It was destroyed by the Romans in 75 AD or 70 AD. No, 75. 75 AD. For the very reason of its licentious behavior. Okay. And she came from that city. Pope Gregory the Great. Pope Gregory the Great says... <laughs> She whom Luke calls the sinful woman, in, in the Gospel of Luke, which you just read. She whom Luke calls the sinful woman, whom John calls Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, we believe to be the Mary from whom seven devils were ejected, according to Mark. And what did these seven devils signify, if not all the vices? This is not in your quotation, I'm sorry. And what did these seven devils signify, if not all the vices? It is clear, brothers, that the woman previously used the ungent to perfume her flesh in forbidden acts. What she therefore displayed more scandalously, she was now offering to God in a more praiseworthy manner. She had coveted with her earthly eyes, but now through penitence these are consumed with tears." She displayed her hair to set off her face, but now her hair dries her tears. She had spoken proud things with her mouth, but in kissing the Lord's feet, she has now planted her mouth on her Redeemer. For every delight, therefore, she had in herself, she now immolated herself. She turned the mass of her crimes to virtues in order to serve God entirely in penance, for as much as she had wrongly held God in contempt. There's a further type of 
our image of Mary Magdalene that the fathers point out to us. And probably the most important for our understanding of who she is when we come to the most important text about her, and that is the resurrection. Okay? The fathers saw in Mary Magdalene a type of Eve in Genesis. You remember St. Paul speaks of our Lord as the new Adam, the new man. And so Mary Magdalene takes on a certain role in that relationship, the role of Eve. Seeing her as Eve, I think, helps to bring an entire uh, interpretive paradigm forward for us. Because if she is Eve, and he is the new Adam, then to understand their relationship, where do we have to go? Genesis. Of course. Always, right? We always have to go back to Genesis. St. Hippolytus of Rome, writing um, the late 2nd century, early 3rd century, says, And so that the women did not doubt the angels at the resurrection, and so that the women did not doubt the angels, Christ himself appeared to them, so that the women become Christ's apostles, and compensate through their obedience for the sin of the first Eve, Eve has become an apostle. So to see Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb as a type of Eve. As a type of Eve. Who else is we, do we see as a type of Eve in the New Testament? Mary. Mary. Of course. Right? Much more famous uh, comparison. Okay, St. Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus, Tertullian, and others identify Mary as the new Eve. I'll give you a sample quote from Tertullian. God recovered his image and likeness, which the devil had seized by a rival operation. For unto Eve as yet a virgin had crept the word, which was the framer of death. Equally into a virgin was to be introduced the word of God, which was the builder up of life. That what by that sex had gone into perdition by the same sex might be brought back to salvation. Eve had believed the serpent. Mary believed Gabriel. The fault which the one committed by believing, the other by believing has blotted out. Okay? So Mary ends up reversing the very things which Eve did. Okay? And therefore she begins to take a role in our salvation as she took a role in our, in our destruction, in our fall. Okay? In Christian Syria, by at least the 500s, with these two traditions coming out, seeing Mary Magdalene as Eve, okay, and seeing Mary as a type of Eve, were intentionally brought together. Okay? By, in some sense, a superimposition of the two. To see them as one, we get a fuller understanding of Eve's role in our salvation. Okay? To see Mary Magdalene and Mary the Mother of God, in a sense, interposed upon each other. Okay? By doing this, Mary Magdalene becomes a bridge, in some sense, a bridge between the old Eve and the new Eve. Mary herself, Mary the mother of God, could never fulfill the role of the old Eve, could she? Okay, in some sense, there was something lacking in her, which was disobedience. Okay? And how were the church fathers to see that reality brought forward in Christ's redemptive work? And it's that tradition, Mary as the bridge between the two, as the old Eve becoming the new Eve, as Eve becoming Mary, that I think is the most helpful for us as we meditate upon her life as an icon of conversion. So, 
This requires us to turn back to Genesis for a minute. So let's go there. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. While you're doing that, I'll read you a short quote from Cardinal John Henry Newman. He says, We are able by the position and office of Eve in our fall to determine the position and office of Mary in our redemption. In other words, watch Eve. See what she does in the fall, and you're going to better understand Mary's role in her relationship with God, her relationship with her son. Okay? We are able by the position and office of Eve in our fall to determine the position and office of Mary in our redemption. Now, let's just remember from some of our studies we've done. How many days in creation? Six. Six days in creation. And on the seventh day, God rested. And how did he rest? What did he do when he rested? He blessed creation. And when a thing is blessed, what happens to it? It's sanctified. It's made holy. It's sanctified. And God himself is the only one that has that attribute of holiness proper to himself. When we say something is blessed... We are associating it with God himself. In some sense, the things that are blessed are brought into covenant union with God himself. Okay? When God on the seventh day blesses creation, he brings creation into union with himself, into covenant union. And when a thing is brought into covenant union with another, what happens to the two things? The two things become one. Thank you. All right. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, Melanie. Until? Until chapter 3, verse 2. Okay. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay, now hold on just a second. What day was man made on? The sixth day. Okay, there is a a, um, common interpretation that the sixth day was when Adam was created. God... Put a deep sleep upon him. He took Eve from his side at the beginning of that first night. And they woke up together on the seventh day. Okay. So that on that seventh day, the bridegroom and the bride would see each other for the first time. And would be united in marriage, not only with their God, but also with each other. Okay. Go ahead, no. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Okay, fine. Fine. Man wakes up, man and woman wake up from their sleep. They behold each other for the first time. And what is the first thing that we find out? What would we expect? What would we expect? Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh, and the man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed, and... What would you expect? What would you expect? Procreation. How How about the divine conversation between man and wife? Okay? For the Jews, conversation, entering into conversation was a sacred affair. It was not as we walk down the street today, hey, how's it going? Hi, keep going. You don't know who the people are. For the Jews to enter into a conversation was very important. You see that with the Samaritan woman at the well. Our Lord starts speaking with her, and the apostles come back and they say, what's he doing? What is he doing? Because in a conversation, don't we give something of ourselves to the person we're speaking to? I don't care what it is that we're speaking about. When I speak, 
I can only speak from who I am and what I know. And that comes forth from me and enters into the other person, literally into their ear. And they speak back to me and the same thing happens. And in some sense, a life is shared together and the two become one. Okay? Where we should have seen a divine conversation between Adam and Eve, and in a sense the divine conversation between mankind and their God, what do we find? A conversation between Eve and the serpent. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more subtle than, other, than any other creature that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, and the woman said to the serpent, back and forth, a conversation which should never have happened in the first place. St. John Chrysostom says, What was the woman doing speaking to the serpent in the first place? Rather, she should have been conversing with the one for whom she had been made, with whom she shared all things on equal terms. Yeah, are, you, are you suggesting that Adam didn't speak with Eve? Because he obviously told her what God said. She knew about that, so he must have spoken. Okay, fine, fine. But clearly, clearly, there's something wrong in the conversation that's taking place. Clearly, on a day when we would expect a covenant union, the scriptures give us something else. Okay? What was she doing speaking to the serpent in the first place? I think at this moment in the scriptures, we, we, we get the first divorce. Okay. In all seriousness, a divorce between Adam and Eve, a divorce between the people and their God. We get the fall. Are you telling me that your wife didn't have a scripture in anybody? <laughs> no, no. What I'm telling you is that in the scriptures, in the scriptures, to speak with another person has great symbolic value. And here, on the day of union, at the beginning of creation. She was in honeymoon and talking with a third person. In a sense, yeah. Maybe not the person. 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 All right. All right. All right. Let's, keep pushing. Let's keep pushing forward and see what we find out. Okay? The fathers like to see in this text a reversal of the proper roles that God had designed us with. Okay? Where Adam should have been the protector of his bride, where was he in the story? Okay? When, when the one... Alright, stay with me, guys. Stay with me. We got some serious stuff to get through here. Okay. The one who was told to till and keep the garden, and who should have fed his bride the fruit of his labor... Where is he? Instead, it is the serpent who encourages Eve to go and pluck of the fruit, to eat of it, and to feed her husband. Okay, and the father's seeing this in reversal. As I said earlier, the, the devil always twists things just a bit. Okay? St. Ephraim says, Eve went after that which her eyes desired. And being enticed by the divinity that the serpent had promised her, she stole away from her husband and ate. In fact, if you read the text carefully, it appears that that happened. That she ate, then she offered some to her husband. Okay? St. Ephraim says, Afterwards she gave some to her husband and he ate with her. Because she believed the serpent, she ate first, thinking that she would be clothed with divinity in the presence of that one from whom she as woman had been separated. She hastened to eat before her husband that she might become head over her head, that she might become the one to give command to the one by whom she was to be commanded. The word command there is a little strong, but. And that she might be older in divinity than that one who is older than her in humanity. Okay? <clears throat> St. 
setting aside for a minute whether she ate first or whether she didn't eat first, the point is clear. That she is the one who bears the fruit of death to her husband. And he ends up leading or following her lead and dragging down the entire human race with him. Okay? Why is that important? Why is that important? Because if Jesus Christ is our Savior and he has come to restore us to that which we lost, then the woman also must be restored. And just as she led the first man into the fall, so she will be an essential component to the restoration. Okay? I said, what about Adam? Clearly he failed in his duty to till the garden, to keep it, to protect it. Okay, when the serpent came close, what should he have done? He should have stood in between his bride and the tempter. But he didn't. In fact, in the text, in the Hebrew, when the serpent says, Did God say to you, he speaks in the plural, indicating that it's possible that Adam was there and just never opened his mouth. Okay. Do you think yeah. that this is all divine providence? It has to be. Maybe. Okay. Is, is Ephraim one of many who says that she stole away from him? Because I've heard it posed yeah. that they're standing right there and he fails to man up. That Adam fails yeah. to, to do just that. Right. To protect right. her. I don't know any other church fathers that say that, that make that point about her taking away and eating. Okay. okay. But others that do talk about that kind of reversal of the roles. And I think that's the most important okay. thing for us. <laughs> in when we come to the story of Christ. Absolutely. Okay. So, he failed in his duty. He failed in his duty to be the husband of men of paradise. Okay? He failed in his duty to be the gardener in image of the divine gardener who had planted paradise in the beginning. Okay? So if we are going to restore Adam to that which he lost, if Jesus Christ is to be our savior, then we better see Jesus Christ doing that very thing which Adam had failed to do. Okay? And sure enough, as we turn to the New Testament and the Gospel of John, what are the first words we read? In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning. John, the Gospel of John intentionally John immediately at the beginning, in a sense, I think, puts a stop sign for us and says, Hey, before you read my gospel, you better go back and read Genesis again. Because you're not going to understand what I'm talking about unless you understand what happened there. And sure enough, if we ignore the fall, then what happens to Jesus Christ? He may be a nice teacher. But he's not the savior of anything, is he? Isn't that the problem we have today? The majority of the people walking around do not believe there's any problem with us. That the fall ever really did take place. And therefore, yeah, Jesus is a nice guy, but that's about where it stops. So we always have to look, when when we're looking at our Lord's work, to keep in the forefront of our mind, paradise itself. That which we lost and how we lost it. Okay? In the Gospel of John, then, in the first chapter, in the beginning, in the first chapter, our Lord descends into the waters of the Jordan River, and he comes forth, forth from the waters to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Father says of him, My son. My son. Not that Jesus was not his son before the, before the baptism. But for the first time, God again could call man his son. It is no great mystery that the Father calls the Word his son. That mystery is true from all eternity. But the great mystery of the baptism of Christ is that we can look at God in the Jordan River and see a man. And it is God who calls that man his son, restoring in Jesus Christ the relationship which God had with Adam in the beginning. 
and in the Gospel of John in chapter 3, when John the Baptist is questioned about our Lord, he says, He is the bridegroom. The bride rejoices when she sees the bridegroom. In the Gospel of John, we are placed in the midst of the story of the Garden of Eden. We are placed in the midst of the story of the Son of God. We are placed in the midst of the story of the bridegroom of paradise. And in Jesus Christ, we who believe he has come to save the world, will see everything which Adam did reversed, restored. And guess what? He will restore Eve also. Okay? Like I said, quoting John Newman, we are able by the position and office of Eve in our fall to determine the position and office of Mary in our redemption. And so similarly, we are able by the position and office of Mary Magdalene in the story of the Son of God to see a restoration of the fallen Eve. She is, in some sense, an icon of the church, the bride of Jesus, coming to him in the middle of the night, coming to him and asking to be united with him. Okay? Father James Groening says this about the passion of our Lord, and I think it's very helpful for us as we enter into the Triduum, enter into the passion. He says, For the beginning of his passion... Jesus chose a wonderfully beautiful garden. How significant this choice was. In a garden, the first Adam had committed the first sin, the sin of disobedience. Therefore, it was in a garden that the second Adam should say to his father, Not what I will, but what thou wilt. In a garden, Adam, by an abuse of liberty, had plunged the entire human race into the most shameful captivity. In a garden, therefore, by the bonds of Christ, our fetters were to be broken. In a garden, God had pronounced the death penalty upon Adam. Hence, in a garden, Christ would take upon him the judgment of this curse. In a garden, the human race was lost. And usually, an object is sought where it was lost. St. Ephraim continues this type of meditation upon Christ's work as the new Adam. And he says, Our Lord subdued his might, and they seized him, so that by his living death he might give life to Adam. He gave his hands to be pierced by the nails in place of the hand that had plucked the fruit. He was struck on the cheek in the judgment hall in return for that mouth that had devoured in Eden. Our Lord was stripped naked so that we might be clothed in modesty, with gall and vinegar, he made sweet the bitter venom that the serpent had poured into mankind. Turn to John chapter 19. At the end of the Gospel of John, as at the beginning, we must keep before our eyes the work of the new Adam. We must keep before our eyes the paradigm of paradise. We must recall what happened in that garden so long ago. Because it is in the end, in the culmination of all things, when the Son of God raises mankind from the dead, that we will see in Him the restoration of all things that we lost. So we keep that in the forefront of our minds. Chapter 19, verse 38. You have that in your quotations there, I believe. Is that there? Verse 38? 39. I'll read you verse 38. <laughs> After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. So he came and took away his body. Melanie, up to verse 1 of chapter 20. Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. 
So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Okay. Do you think it's an accident? (laughs) Our Lord dies and he is buried in a tomb in a garden in the Gospel of John. And it is the first day of the week. And we know in the Gospel of John that we began in the beginning. And what happened on the first day of the week in the, in the story of creation? What did God create? Light. Thank you. Light shined into the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Do you think it's an accident that we are in a garden on the first day of the week? And guess what? It's dark out. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was made nothing that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. It is dark, and the light of the world is dead in a tomb. St. Ephraim says, Christ's tomb and the garden are symbols of Eden where Adam died a hidden death. For he had fled and hidden himself among the trees as though he had entered a tomb and been covered over. The living one, once entombed, has now arisen in the garden and raised up that Adam who had fallen in the garden. From the tomb does Christ bring Adam in glory into the marriage feast of the Garden of Paradise. Into the marriage feast of the Garden of Paradise. Verse 1 through 11, Melanie. Of 20. Chapter 20, verse 1 through 11. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they both went toward the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying, and the napkin which had been lying had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. Okay. (coughs) Don't keep reading. Yeah. Okay. Not telling everybody else. What's it look like? What's the story look like? I've been talking to you guys a lot about getting into the story of Scripture. You gotta walk through the story. You gotta see it happen. You gotta do it yourself. I was just thinking tonight as I was preparing for this. I would give I would give everything. Well, maybe not everything, but to go to Jerusalem and run. From the place Mary Magdalene did to the tomb, back to where the disciples were, and back to the tomb, and see how it felt. Run. She ran. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while it was still dark to anoint the body of Christ. Why? She hadn't done it the day before because it was the Sabbath. They had taken our Lord down from the cross, laid him in a tomb, and did not have time to properly anoint him. And so Mary Magdalene is stuck waiting for the Sabbath to finish. And as soon as she can, while it is still dark out, she can't sleep. She goes to the tomb while it is still dark out. She didn't have a flashlight. She finds her way to the tomb because there's nowhere else for her to go. She has spent a whole day suffering the loss of our Lord. And she's the first one in darkness to go to the tomb. 
She runs when she finds out they have taken away our Lord. She runs to the apostles. Okay? Probably broke in the door and said, they have taken away our Lord and I don't know where they have put him. The disciples ran. Peter and John ran to the tomb. And Mary Magdalene ran right back with them. And when they were done, when they looked into the tomb and they saw and believed, they went home. But Mary Magdalene stayed there and she wept bitter tears. She wept. I think it's helpful for us. Oftentimes I think what it must have been like for Eve to watch her husband grow old. To watch Adam get sick. And if she lived longer than him, to hold him in her arms while she died. While he died. Knowing all the time that she had a hand in what was happening to him. And how she must have wept when her husband died. And where would she have gone? Where would Eve have gone once her husband died? Where could she go? Yeah. This was the man she was made for. This was her life. This was everything to her. And I think she must have stayed there and just wept, knowing her role in his death. Okay? Similarly for Mary Magdalene, similarly for us, we know that it wasn't just the Jews that crucified Christ, that we had a part in that, that he died because of our sins. And Mary Magdalene probably knew that better than all, for he had healed her from her sins. By tradition, she was a harlot, and she had left harlotry, and she had found the one for whom she had been made, with whom she shared all things on equal terms, who God had brought her into existence to love. And here he was, dead. And worse than that, when she came to his tomb, she did not even have the consolation of anointing his body. Gone. And she wept. St. Augustine says, The eyes that had sought for the Lord and had not found him were now free for tears, grieving more that he had been taken away from the sepulcher than that he had been slain on the wooden cross, since not even a memorial place was now left behind. There was nothing for her. She had given up her life. She had followed him. She had served him day in and day out. She had nowhere else to go. And so she she stayed there and she wept. Verse 10 through 15, Lily. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Saying this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Father Mark Gruber, who we were very blessed to have here, says this. Did Mary suppose that he was the gardener? She was wrong, and yet she was also right. He was a gardener, not as she supposed him. But this was the gardener who placed Adam and Eve in paradise, who provided an Eden for them of every kind of flowering tree and fruitful vine. This was the original gardener who created us in his image and likeness, who gave us, through Adam and Eve, the invitation to union with God, and was now going to restore us to the garden from which we had been banished. Go back to verse 10. Until what? I'm going to read it. 
Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and she wept. As she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. Pull out your um, little hand out there. Turn your page. We have a nice long quote. I put it out there for you. It's quite long, but absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Father Mark Gruber. Are you there? Okay. When did Mary no longer see the gardener, but see the risen Son of God? When did her eyes finally perceive that he was not a caretaker, a custodian, that he was not a maintenance worker, but the divine son of the living God, the risen Christ? St. John's Gospel tells us that when Jesus uttered to her but one word, her eyes were opened, and the word that he uttered was simply her name, Mary. No one can re reproduce the timbre of the Savior's voice, its warmth, its resonance, its cadence. But it was a sound that came from his lips, a sound which revealed in its speaking the depth of the love in his heart. There is a way of naming someone that is greater than sound, the speaking of the name more accurate than syllables, more expressive than words. And Jesus, the divine teacher, who held crowds spellbound for years, who spoke as no one had ever spoke, spoke but one word. By a single word he captured her, he grasped her heart. He identified her. He knew her. Her whole being was, as it were, laid bare before him. In a moment, as she was quick, and she was quickened by his naming her name, Mary. To be known and yet to be loved, to be well known and to be well loved, to be seen and to be called out, to be named and identified with intimate love. That's what Jesus conveyed by a single word. And in a single moment, Mary knew that no one else could love like that but him. Mary knew that no one knew her heart and soul like that but him. How well she knew that no one else could speak her name like that but him. She answered him, Rabboni. St. John tells us the word Rabboni means teacher. Actually, the word Rabbi means teacher. Rabboni is the familiar form of the word in Aramaic, which notes the meaning, my teacher. It's personal, my, he belongs to me. Mary, Jesus said, my teacher, she answered. It was a kind of betrothal of the divine heart to the heart of this woman. They named each other. That's how she recognized him, by the sound of her name. Let's go back one more time to verse 10. We're close to being done here for you when you need to leave. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, 
to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and said to the, and said to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. I'll conclude with a quote from Dom Prosper Garanger, who says, On that great Easter morning, Magdalene, sorry, on that great Easter day, Magdalene, like a morning star, announced the rising of the Son of Justice, who is never more to set. Woman, said Jesus to her, why weepest thou? Thou art not mistaken, he seemed to say. It is indeed the divine gardener speaking to thee, the same that planted Eden in the beginning. But now dry thy tears in this new garden, whose center is an empty tomb. Paradise is restored. The angels no longer close the entrance. Here is the tree of life, which has borne fruit these three days past. This fruit, which thou, O woman, art eager as of old to seize and taste, belongs to thee now by right, for thou art no longer Eve, but Mary. If thou art, for, art bidden not to touch it yet, it is because as thou wouldst not heretofore taste the fruit of death thyself alone, thou mayest not now enjoy the fruit of life till thou bringest back him that was first lost through thee. Go and get the apostles. Mary Magdalene becomes the first apostle to the apostles. She goes out to the world to bring mankind back to its Savior. Okay? As we begin, well, we've already begun our preparations for Holy Week, but as we intensify our devotions for Holy Week, I think Mary Magdalene is a great icon for us of conversion. I think she's helpful to us to teach us the desire which God wants us to have in our hearts, to seek him in the middle of the night, to run to his tomb, to prepare ourselves, to wait and wait and wait for the first moment, to desire him with tears. And only then will we see the one who's resurrected from the dead. The apostles had to wait. They walked away. He had, in a sense, come to them. But Mary Magdalene waited there, and she was rewarded for her efforts. And so will we be rewarded for our efforts. If you're not planning on going to the Easter Vigil, because it's just too long, and it goes just too late at night, then guess what? You're going to miss the resurrection. <laughs> He'll rise from the dead, sure enough. But you won't be there to see it. I want to encourage you, as we intensify our devotions, get rid of everything else, because nothing else matters. Turn off the television, turn off the radio, call work and tell them you're not coming in. It doesn't matter. Give yourself that time to seek the Lord in the darkness, and He will come and shine in the soul of your life, in your heart. Okay? Thank you guys very much for coming tonight. So you know, actually, I, I'm a few minutes over, so what I'm going to do is, why don't we take a 60-second break like we normally do, stand up. Those people that want to leave can feel free to leave. Those that want to stay for a few questions, I'll answer them, okay? of the word woman with which, with which the angels in Christ call Magdalene the same as at um, um, Christ is crucified. What he says to Mary. Is that word the same oh, in Hebrew? I, I haven't, I, well, it's in, it would be in Greek because John was written in Greek. But, oh, okay. Yeah. But, I'm sorry. That's right. Yeah, but, but uh, it would be I, don't, I would guess. I, but I don't know. The, the better question is, or not, it's not really a question, but to point out that he calls her woman Right? And how is Eve identified in the Garden of Paradise? As a woman. Right? So he calls her by the same name. So, I mean, John is just, and we're just hitting it, you know, since that's the tip of the iceberg. And really is the tip, because it's like, we're at the very top of it, the resurrection. But the entire gospel is just loaded with creation imagery. It's just, you know, so.
but it might it just yeah I'd go ahead well, I guess I'm going to be embarrassed if you ask a question I can't answer the same question I, yeah. are, you, are you saying did you, did you use the word pearl and, and pearl did you use the word pearl uh-huh. when, the, when, the, when the serpent when the serpent made the point uh-huh. uh, uh, did God say to you would you use oh, plural Plural. Yes, plural. yes. In Hebrew. in Hebrew, it's in the plural. So it's indicated possibly that they're both there, and that Adam is just not enough of a man in some sense to stand up. The entire, you know, the entire passion of our Lord can be put in these terms because it's really the devil is seeking his bride. The devil has been seeking his bride from the beginning, and it's now Jesus Christ who says no more. And he stands in between, as Adam should have done, whatever the consequences may be. And he goes to battle with the devil, and he ends up nailed to a cross, buried in a tomb. And, as the fathers tell us, when the light of life enters darkness, just when I turn on, like when I turn on a light in the room, what happens to the darkness? It's no more. And so when life enters into death, Death is destroyed from the inside. Okay? As St. Saint, as Saint Paul says, Christ having died once, death no longer has dominion over him. He has conquered it for us. Okay? Anyways. Is that, Mary Magdalene the sister of Martha? Uh, what I'm saying is that Pope Gregory the Great seems to indicate that possibility. Whether she was or not, I think still these images in the New Testament, these different women, are helpful to us to understand why the church has said that she had this past. We don't know what her past was from the scriptures, right? But the traditional belief is that she had this type of past. And it makes sense then that she comes to the tomb of our Lord, and what does she do? But enter, enter into that divine conversation that they should have had in the beginning. And as, and as, as Father Boober says, they named each other. Right? And it was a type of betrothal, the divine betrothal. Yeah. I find to see how is that she is the new Eve, like like Mary. Yeah, the because Catholicism. yeah, because she in a sense comes from that life of sin, the life of the old Eve, right? The one, as Saint John Chrysostom says, who spoke with the one for whom she was not made. She right. spoke with the servant, right? So in some sense, Mary Magdalene had had that conversation, that covenantal union with men that she had not been made for, right. right? But now she comes full conversion to the feet of our Lord, right? Renounces her past life and enters into that divine conversation with him. And as Father Gruber said, it is a type of betrothal. The two, the two hearts are brought together. And so she acts as that bridge in between Eve and Mary. And that's what he says, right? You are no longer, or Garanger picks that up. Don Prosper Garanger picks that up and says, you are no longer Eve, but Mary. Okay? And as Mary also entered into that conversation with our Lord at the wedding at Cana. Okay? Yes, Lewis. When uh, Mary Magdalene runs back to Peter and the rest of the apostles, she doesn't use the singular. She said, we don't know where to find him. It's 22. What verse? Verse 2. Verse what? Verse, verse two. John 20. Verse two. So she ran to the side of Peter and there is a... It said, they have taken away our Lord and we do not know where they have laid him. Oh, yeah, that's a good point, Lewis. And, yeah, in the other Gospels, they talk about Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb with other women. Yeah. You know? It says that they have taken him away. The tomb was, well, well, it was guarded, right, by the, the Romans. Yeah, so she, and he probably knew that. Probably his followers knew, what, you know, that he was guarded, and so they, yeah, whoever they were. But I think Lewis's so point there is good. Another woman with her, exactly, yeah. exactly. But John really picks up on Mary Magdalene, and continues that, right? It right. says it is her that stays and weeps and waits and talks, and she's rewarded for that. Okay, so. Yes, Bill. Yeah, what, uh, are you familiar with the recent uh, uh, change in attitudes towards uh, Mary Magdalene, St. Mary Magdalene, by the Vatican? Was it the Pope who came out and said it was wrong that, that, that we called her a prostitute? They recently right. came out and said John Paul II. John Paul II didn't like that so much, and some some have not liked that so much. What, do you know, you what, know? what actually was said or what did I don't. I, do not, I have not read his writing on that. Um, I, I would just say that 
it would be good to read it. It's not an infallible statement. Fine. Uh, however, um, whether she was a prostitute or not, whether she's a prostitute or not, every time we sin, we go after another Lord, yeah. another God, however small it is. And so in every situation like this, and Mary Magdalene is a good example, she is doing that very thing. She's turning away from her former life of sin. She's coming to her Lord and binding herself to Him. And so even in that, she becomes an image of both the fallen Eve and the restored Eve. Okay? So there's different interpretations on that point. There's a lot of argument there, especially the early church father criticized that Eve should not have come conducted a conversation with yeah. a serpent yeah. according to a Jewish tradition. Right. Okay. If they're the first couple, there was no Jewish You mean? No, that's, not the, that's not the point. That's not the point at all. The point is that the moment that they read, I, mean, I don't care what tradition you're in, right? Here Eve is probably the most beautiful woman besides the Virgin Mary, right? Created immaculate, right? And and I mean, what guy? I don't know what he was thinking, you know? But, but, it, but anyways, but the thing is, it, the point is that regardless of what tradition or what custom or whatever, there's still there's still that reality that the one who we're made for, we're to live with. And immediately, she's not living with him. And he's not living with her in the text itself, you know. Alright, one more one more question if there's is one. Just one quickie. All right, well, I've seen a couple of these things on uh, Discovery Channel and all that. The, uh, the, I guess the feminist or the paganistic look or whatever it is about this, it was saying that the reason St. Mary Magdalene was considered a, um, uh, a prostitute and all that was so that people would not uh, basically realize uh, that she was the first apostle and that, uh, you know, one of the major apostles of Christ, uh, that a woman shouldn't be like this so that they wouldn't give uh, honor to women and that type of thing, you know. That, that well, all I can say is that the early church did give her honor. Yeah. So, you know, they, 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 it's, it's nice to study history. And it's nice to study history, but if you ignore the church fathers, then you're not studying the right history. The whole undercurrent yeah. of those programs is dismissive of yeah. the faith. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a spend time. time. Yeah. 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 So, all right. Let's, well, well, I think the audience is after. Uh, I'm fine. Okay, go ahead. Quick. One more thing, real quick. Um, Song of Songs is, is something yeah. I love to read to Absolutely. him at, at Eucharistic Adoration on First Friday. Yeah. And I always, I always loved it up, to, especially to a point I could see myself as the Shulamite who had intended her garden so well. And was, you yeah. Know, there is a text but in there. Then it yeah. gets to the part where you know he looks at her and says, "My spotless one, my dove." And all I can yeah. see was the Blessed Virgin, which of course mm -hmm. the, the typology is there. But this tonight about Mary Magdalene. Maybe I can see myself a little bit clearer. There, than, yeah. Than, yeah, as the transition. There you, you go. Know, so there I, you that's, go. That's her, the bridge. So there's a beautiful text in the song, in the song of, um, of Solomon. It actually in these very terms, that I sought the one, I could not find him, right? And I went about asking, oh, it's absolutely amazing, yeah. beautiful. So in conclusion, I want to invite you guys again, Holy Saturday morning, 10, 15, uh, is my baby's baptism, and the service, the first service of the resurrection in our church. So you can come and experience that. It's really an amazing service, and uh, you're all more than welcome at Holy Transfiguration. If you don't have the invitation and you want to come, talk to me afterwards and I'll tell you the, uh, the address, okay? Let's conclude in the prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, for all of that end. Amen. St. John the Beloved, pray for us. St. Mary Magdalene, pray for us. St. John the Apostles, Ophelia, Spinach, Asante. Amen. Amen.